We come to this third Sunday of Advent uh, together as we still are in the midst of our waiting, (laughs) our waiting, and maybe actively, maybe passively at times, but our waiting for the coming of the celebration of the Christ child. Hear these words of scripture. When they heard the king, the Magi went, and look, the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they honored him. They opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we know we all have blind spots. We cannot really see how to love sometimes, and and who loves us, and certainly we don't see at times the love that you have for us. Thank you for the Magi, God. They could see who to love, and in return, they were willing to come from far away to love lavishly with their presence and with their gifts, and they were loved. Make us your loving disciples for the sake of the world. May we lavish gifts not just on those we see, but upon those whom you, God, help us to see and who are in need of need of your forgiving, grace-filled, redeeming love. Amen. Amen. O come, O come, Emmanuel. So this day we relight the candle of peace as we did on the first Sunday of Advent, and the candle of hope as we did last Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent. And now this third day of Advent, we light the candle that symbolizes and reminds us of the love of God. Hear this reading from the Gospel of Luke. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. Now the virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. Well, she was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said, Well, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, 
and there will be no end to his kingdom. Well, then Mary said to the angel, well, how, 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 how would this happen since, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? And the angel then replied, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be called holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman, who was labeled unable to conceive, is, is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible with God. And then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We continue with the reading from the Gospel of Luke. Mary got up and, and hurried to a city in the Judean hill highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, well, the child, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, Ha! Oh, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child that you carry. Why do I have this honor that the, the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises that he had made to her. And then Mary said, Oh, with all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone from one generation to the next who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, and just as he had promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. Mary then stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates.
as we gather together again this morning uh, to hear a word from God, <laughs> we're still meditating upon that, that wonderful, awful story <laughs> of how the Grinch stole Christmas. I don't know. Can you think of a, can you think of a time like, like the Grinch found himself in where you just knew you were a right about something, where you absolutely were convinced only to discover that, well, maybe things weren't quite as clear as you thought they were. Uh, maybe in fact, um, maybe in fact, uh, light shines into the world into a way that we hadn't anticipated. We find ourselves in the middle of the Grinch's story. Uh, remember how it unfolds, you know? He sneaks around, um, of course, uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, when else is a, a thief going to, to come, right? But when people are not looking for him, comes in the middle of the night to steal away Christmas. And uh, the very first house he comes to, he uh, is uh, surprised by uh, Cindy Lou Who, who comes around the corner, uh, noting that he's stuffing a Christmas tree up the chimney, and she just simply asks, uh, Santa, uh, why are you taking our Christmas tree? And of course, without missing a beat, he immediately responds, well, there's a light bulb on the backside that's not working, and I'm taking it to my workshop so that it can be repaired and brought right back. And of course, giving her then her glass of water and, uh, and shooing her off to bed, he continues his mischievous work uh, right in through the night. So you see, the Grinch was so convinced, so convinced that he was right, that he could somehow stop Christmas from coming, stop all this hoopla, stop all this fuss and this noise and this false pretense of being joyful. He, could, he was so convinced that he could do this that he could just so easily lie about it, <laughs> that he could, <laughs> he could just go on about his business without his, his heart even skipping a single beat. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> we suspect, as we're reading the story, at least as adults, that maybe he doesn't quite get it, that he doesn't even know and understand quite clearly why in the world he hates Christmas in the first place. Being human, of course, means that we all have limited vision, don't we? That somehow, um, that somehow we just can't really see right in front of us sometimes, just like the Grinch couldn't really see Christmas. He could hear the noise about it, he could you know, sense all the fuss about it, but somehow just felt it was all um, just pretense somehow. And, and when he became convinced about that, of course, he had to do something about it after all. But think about what happens in this season that we are preparing for, this Christmas season in which we really offer our celebrations of praises and joy. Think about what really happens. God comes to us in this human flesh, which means that God comes willingly to live within our body and all of its limitations. The inability to to see uh, clearly uh, uh, the, 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 this body that is filled with vulnerability, this, this body which is, yeah, filled with short-sightedness that causes us to all, all, do all kinds of hateful things. Now imagine, as we heard just a moment ago in Scripture, imagine um, the life of Mary for a moment with me. Mary was just a regular young woman. Um, and I would imagine she probably didn't have any other uh, extraordinary expectations of life, any different than any other woman her age. You know, 
um, coming of age meant uh, uh, um, probably a matchmaker or somebody uh, you know in the village or in the family would have paired her with a uh, you know a prospective husband and 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 you know everybody knew that you know uh, shortly after marriage there would begin to be children and you would settle into life you know as this part of new chapter would just unfold like everybody expected it to <laughs> and yet and yet um, would she have ever expected would she have ever expected that there would be children um, coming before the marriage. So no wonder that when, when, when she heard the angel say, uh, what were the words again? Don't be afraid, Mary. Uh, God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. It's no wonder that, that when she heard these very words, her very first reaction would be a shocking, how? <laughs> How's this going to happen? How, how will this take place? She had not envisioned life being this way, had she? And yet, and yet, and yet, Mary somehow, even as a good girl, even, even as a girl properly raised, perhaps, um, she wasn't so sure that she knew life at that point, like maybe a lot of us as teenagers would have been. She wasn't so sure that she knew exactly what was going to happen tomorrow, uh, next week, or next year. See, she wasn't so overly sure about this that she couldn't hear a new possibility. She couldn't see and maybe begin to understand a plan that God had for her that was nowhere near the radar of her thinking. How could this scandalous, um, the scandalous truth be true? <laughs> How could the scandalous truth of a, of a pregnancy that would come upon her, uh, even though it was before she, she knew her intended uh, husband? How could this happen? Well, with patience, the angel of God would explain. God was going to offer her first a sign to help her be assured that God was at work in the world. And the sign would be her kinswoman, somebody she knew, Elizabeth, who had been um, now in old age, who had been without a child, who had been declared barren, unable to conceive. <laughs> you know, the talk of her village, you know, look at that old woman. What was the matter with her? Did she sin? Did her family sin? And yet, and yet, um, sure enough, uh, after this conversation with, with angel Gabriel, uh, Mary drops everything she's doing and, 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 and goes south into the Judean hills to meet up with her kinswoman, Elizabeth, and finds the sign that had been promised to her there. In an instant, she could see <laughs> the very physical change happening uh, in, 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 uh, in Elizabeth's body. She could see physically the sign of God just as it had been promised. Now, remember, remember that Elizabeth herself, um, Scripture tells us, uh, uh, if we'd have started the reading a bit before we did this morning, tells us that she had been in hiding up to this point. She wasn't sure what to make of this. She was also caught uh, by surprise, you know, never having expected it that this stage of life, this kind of thing could take place. And so not sure what to make of it, she was hiding herself. And when Mary comes something amazing happens. And Elizabeth tells us about that, doesn't she? She tells us how the, the baby, when the baby hears the voice of Mary greeting her, how the baby leaps in her womb. And immediately, with Elizabeth's heart being open to new possibilities, to this new love of God shadowed upon her, how she hears what it means. And she shares with uh, she shares with, uh, with Mary uh, this, this leaping for joy, this, this, this greeting that the child in her womb offers, not just Mary, but now the, the, the child that is conceived in her womb. It's no wonder then Mary, who sees the sign, who knows the promise, who she herself is able with an open heart to see how God is lovingly now um, acting in her life. And she responds to Elizabeth, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. The greatest weakness that God has for all of us is how God loves us, right? God loves us. And God's love is not just something that's a little bit here and there. God's love is a, is a very powerful force in the world. It's a very powerful force upon our lives, each one of us. It's so powerful that 
that God's love um, chooses us before we're even conceived in our mother's wombs, knits together the vision and the idea of who we will become, and then, and then sets in motion to put us together in our mother's womb. And, and from the day we are born, God continues to, to lavish love upon us so that we will become the full presence of God's plan in the world. Now, know this, <laughs> know this, that, that God gives us yeah, finitude, that is, we have limitations in this human body. God creates us dependent. You know, at first we're dependent fully upon our, our mothers and then our families and then upon our communities and always upon each other in the world. And then we're created um, uh, feeling as if we never quite have enough because we are so dependent. We're created with a sense of scarcity. Oh, I, I need more. I need to hold back uh, so that I have some for myself so I can survive. We, we have all this about us, but there's good news. The good news is that this love that God lavishes upon us all of our lives will continue to pour out as it did beginning with uh, Mary and certainly as it did for Elizabeth. So it'll continually pour out so that we can grow in this love, be set free from our limitations, be set free from our inability to see God's plan for who we can become, to be set free from a sense of scarcity so that we can live fully in the abundance of God and experience the fullness of God's joy. Oh, but joy, that's, that's next Sunday's word. Mary had begun at this very precious young age to live into the fullness of the power of God and what God would invite her to become. Now God's love, of course, God's love would not at all, um, would not at all force us to become anything. Uh, even as Mary traveled south and met up with her kinswoman, as she found that it was true, as she saw the sign, um, she could then begin to understand maybe even more fully in the gentleness of, of God's love how this child in her would become love to the world, how this child in her would become like the voice of the angel who's not trying to force us into anything, who's not trying to force us to become something, but we begin to hear and see even in Mary, if you will, well, something of that prophetic presence helping us to understand that the Messiah would become one who would come with not warfare, but compassion, uh, not force, but with gentleness. Uh, the one who would come inviting us, yeah, okay, to take up our cross, to, to, to be living sacrificially for one another, for the sake of the world, for the sake of God's kingdom, but this one Messiah who would come would be coming with us to give us the same kind of imitation that Mary had received. She wasn't forced into this carrying the child of God. She, she wasn't forced, but she experienced the invitation out of love and gentleness to consider being a, a servant of God in this very special way. Even if we don't always know what we thought we always knew, <laughs> even if what we think we're good at or what we think we are born to do doesn't come out in the way we planned it, with an open heart, with a heart that's willing to grow, with a heart that's being willing to be directed by God's love, might we not become ever more fully ourselves, the very presence in the world around us that God intended, that God designed us for. We can stop pretending to be somebody else. <laughs> We can stop pretending to be good at something that we really just hate to do, but we think people, the other people want, want us to be doing it. When Elizabeth, when Elizabeth shares um, uh, you know, her own experience of, of a leaping of joy, um, it, is it not for the very sake that Mary could just be this servant of God, that Mary could just be free to accept this invitation to be herself in the very role, even if going back to the village herself after three months, now beginning to show the signs of what's happening to her, even if going back to that village meant that there would be scandal, that people would talk, that maybe even her parents uh, would potentially reject her. Even with all that awareness, 
she can still respond to the sign of the child in Elizabeth, as was promised to her. She can still you know, respond to that by, by, by exclaiming, with my heart, I glorify the Lord. She is so filled with love that she can fully experience the love of God upon herself and just be herself. <laughs> oh, if only I could be that every day. If only I could be set free out of God's love every day in that way. Through God's grace, we are being offered the opportunity to grow, to grow into God's calling, calling of us, just like Mary was called. We might believe that, well, uh, we're already sure of who we are. But you know, I'm learning that, and I have learned that at every stage of my life, and as I meet folks who are in well, we might think the final decade of their lives, how they continue, many of them, uh, that we meet to be just so open to continually growing, to being somebody that they truly are in an age in which they may find even their bodies being more limited than ever before, or maybe limitations put on their own ability uh, to be thinking clearly, but still being open to the love of God they might find that with a little bit of humbling <laughs> that we all experience in our limitations, that we are still in God's life, with God's love and God's grace, we are still able to express and do the impossible. Because again, what's the good news in all of this and the good news that was given to Mary and through Jesus Christ to all the world? With God, the impossible happens. Like Mary, like the Grinch. When our hearts grow, we grow into the possibilities that God has for us. We can begin to see what otherwise is written off as impossible. Now, we don't need to be sure that we're right. <laughs> the Grinch on top of Mount Crumpet, holding on to that sled that was about to teeter uh, into the depths of the valley next door. Uh, he didn't need to be sure that he was right. Instead, uh, in, in a moment, with the sound of the singing that the who's after they'd come out of their houses, their empty houses, after they'd come out and, and circled around in, in, a, in a square that no longer had the central Christmas tree, and as they sang with a joy upon their hearts, much as Mary sang in expression of the sign of God in Elizabeth, uh, the, 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 the heart of the Grinch could begin to consider for the very first time that maybe, Maybe Christmas was something more. The Grinch was so certain that his plan would work that he could stop Christmas. He was so certain that he knew what he knew, just like sometimes we can be. But isn't it great? <laughs> isn't it wonderful that love is what met the heart of the Grinch? That love is what meets our hearts when we are absolutely the most certain and convinced we know the answers. It is love that comes to us to continually grow us into the love of God. So here's the question for us, friends, as we continue our days towards the celebration of the Christmas season. Are we ready? Are our hearts ready to grow? Uh, have we set aside all those things that we think we knew, <laughs> that we were so convinced of, uh, things that might cause us to go off the deep end and begin to declare the things we hate, and if we're miserable, we make others miserable too? Are our hearts ready to grow into the certainty not of our own, but to the certainty of God's love that has come into the world? Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, your love comes down to us at Christmas, not just once long ago, but again and again and again. And as it comes down in each year of our lives, as it comes down in each season of our lives, as love comes to us, Lord, may we be prepared to let go of all things we thought sure, so that we might be open to your new possibilities, Lord, of being clearer about what is truth, about being certainly more convinced about the truth of your kingdom and not just the truth of our own desires. Uh, Lord, may your love melt our hearts, uh, preparing them to be, well, three sizes bigger. Uh, and, and if this could happen, Lord, if this could happen every year to everyone on the face of the planet, would there be war anymore? 
Would there be crying and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? Perhaps not. For if all could know, if all could know your love, Lord, uh, that understands that with you nothing is impossible, then surely, surely your kingdom will have come. Thank you, God, for your presence of your holy word. Thank you, God, for this season of preparation. Thank you, God, for your love in the power of grace. Amen. Indeed, love came down at Christmas. Brothers and sisters, as um, you go into your week this week, watch for the signs of God. <laughs> if you really find yourself thinking, oh, I know this, <laughs> I know that, and, and maybe feeling a moment of certainty, let it go. Because surely the things that we probably think we know the best or know the most, we actually discover we know the least. In this way, let us humble ourselves and let God's love into our hearts just a little bit more. And maybe, like Elizabeth, feel within us a leaping for joy of the love of God. Go in his grace and peace. Amen.